speak of the early days, uh, and uh, I won't uh, repeat again many of the things you've heard. I will say that he's justifiably recognized as one of the exceptional experimentalists in the field. I, Martin did seminal experiments. The positronium is his trademark. He was uh, a signal figure in the laboratory beyond his own researches, director during the period of the J. Psi excitement. So let me, without further ado, turn to Martin, an exceptional person as well. Okay. Uh, it was really impossible to prepare this, uh, to make this talk. And I, uh, so obviously I can't give the talk, but I'll have to tell you why I can't give the talk. And that's what I'm going to spend my time on. Uh, does somebody know the next line? Vicky, whom did you have in Latin in the sixth? You should know the, no? Uh, all right. Uh, clearly, I, this, is the, this is Virgil, I think, and uh, says the first age was the golden age. Hmm? And uh, so I think I'm supposed to speak about what I am supposed to perceive as the golden age. And I tried very hard to do that. And I uh, said, well, it's obviously true that the days of uh, tabletop physics, as it was first called in, in preparing this, uh, was the, the uh, age in which everything was wonderful. You didn't have the bureaucracy. You uh, uh, didn't have to, to worry about money. Uh, you had lots of ideas. Uh, the uh, uh, experiments went quickly. And uh, so I, I was trying to understand what the basis for this golden age really was. And so, of course, I made the model, I made the theory, and started working on it. And I concluded that the problem was not that, at least I, I think, the cause was not that experiments were smaller, because I think compared with the gross national product, they are not that much cheaper, uh, not, not that much more expensive or bigger now, uh, maybe uh, one order of magnitude, but not three or four. So it had to be people. So it had to have to do with uh, the interaction between people. And uh, I will, at the end of this talk, uh, tell you the, the conclusion that I reached and why I can't give the talk. But, uh, uh, but I tried. I started out, and uh, what you have here is a time scale, because I didn't want to write that on each of these pieces of paper. So I started out by saying, well, what did I do in this time interval? This time interval goes from 1946 to, uh, it, it peters out somewhere around 1960. And I will uh, tell you why I stop about them. What I wrote on this first slide, which is not, not very important, uh, but uh, to guide me on the time scale was where I was at some of these, ti uh, some of these times. And uh, it turned out that uh, I was away uh, more of the time than I had realized. Uh, I had, uh, starting 1946, which is the year of the Big Bang as far as we are concerned, I was away in 47, 48, which seemed uh, in retrospect incredible that I left uh, here after a year. In 52, I was busy in Washington, 53, 54 in Paris. The other things that happened that I've marked here is the following. The Laboratory of Nuclear Science started as a laboratory for nuclear science and engineering. And in, at this point, the engineering disappeared from the progress reports. So something happened here. And the work I was doing was in a group called Radioactivity and Cyclotron Group. And at this point, the cyclotron was no longer mentioned. And here in 1955, something interesting happened. My name appeared in the progress reports as somebody responsible for something. Until then, it was all Bob Evans. And that, I think, is a clue 
to what happened in those years. Uh, I think Hermann Feschbach and I are the only ones here that go back to before the Big Bang. The, uh, uh, I had been, I got my uh, PhD here under Bob Evans in nuclear physics and then left uh, as soon as I got my citizenship and could do such things, uh, for Los Alamos. At, uh, unbeknownst to me, the department had decided not to uh, continue my appointment here. If I'd known that, I might have been a little worried. But uh, when I came back, really in a way, I, I picked up where I left off. But something very important had changed in that time. And that was the status of nuclear physicists. They'd been Los Alamos, they'd been the bomb, and we came back with a feeling of success. In a funny way, I think, we felt we could do anything. Certainly, the rest of the United States thought we could do anything. The uh, description of what happened when Oppenheimer got off the plane is quite quite standard. In fact, uh, I remember uh, going uh, to a wash in a Washington meeting in the line at the hotel and somebody says, oh, my mama, I'm sorry, we must have uh, lost your reservation or something, we don't have a room. And I said to the man, uh, this is Dr. Oppenheimer, you do have a room. And he looked at this, oh yes, sir. <laughs> it, it, it went that way. But the real feeling of having arrived came in 1952, quite late, at a meeting in Amsterdam. I, you know, I tended not to have my hair cut uh, as often as I should have. Now I never get it cut by a barber, I do it myself. But uh, uh, that, therefore, when I went to, a bar, uh, to, to the barber to get my hair cut, they usually would say, what are you, a musician? And what happened was, in Amsterdam, I got my hair cut and the man looked at me and says, what are you, a nuclear physicist? <laughs> and that showed that we had arrived. But seriously, I think, uh, I think that was probably the real element, at least I thought, that was the big element. The other element that made this such an exhilarating uh, period, of course, was the fact, at least I thought, that we didn't have to write proposals, we didn't have to, uh, to persuade uh, outsiders uh, that what we're doing was worthwhile. The relationship with the funding agencies, at least initially, was uh, very interesting. They thought they knew much less than we did. I'm not so sure they were right, but that was certainly the relationship. The idea, the way, the way our activities were supported was we want to support the good people to do what they want because that's the way we have been successful. The physicists, uh, there was a feeling the physicists did, in a certain sense, the decisive things in the war, radar and the bomb, and not because they had been working on communications or on bombs. That sank in. And we were treated with deference. What can we do to help you? And the relations between Washington and the universities was that. The, the idea was that we, as, as creative scientists, were a national asset, and that the purpose of the operation was to strengthen this national asset. Today, there it seems to be that we are contractors, and the important thing is that we're assumed to cheat, like all other contractors, therefore have to be, uh, be treated in the same way, Furthermore, we, are, we apparently engage in violations of antitrust laws. Maybe we do, I don't know. I think uh, uh, what happened later on was that, unfortunately, the people in Washington uh, learned too much. They got too good. They, they knew too much physics. Today, the, our problem is not that they don't know physics, that they know too much physics. They, not only do they think they can make sensible decisions, but they can make sensible decisions indeed. And sometimes they are right. And that cramps our style. But uh, whatever it is, that was my thinking on the subject. 
When I came back uh, from Los Alamos, I had a program. The program was that I would work on two things. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about myself, not because I think it was the most important thing that happened, but because the experience was a personal one. And if I start talking, except uh, in, in, in substantive context, about experiences of others, I only dilute what is really, I think, you expect me to, to convey. Uh, I had two ideas. One thing was I was going to study nucleus, what we today would say nuclear structure through radioactive decay processes. I'd done that before the war. The thing had gone on right into the war years. I'd even done a little bit of that in Los Alamos. And the other thing that I was going to study was beta decay, or today we would say weak interaction physics. And what I did not think of, although I should have stated it at the time, was, of course, electromagnetic interactions in nuclear processes. The funny thing is those were the ones that turned out the most interesting, but I went back over the, the progress reports of the lab, and I found no mention of electromagnetic interactions till quite a bit later. So I said, well, I looked through the records. What went on? What did we do? What did I do? I don't mean just I by myself, but what, what did the, the physics in my orbit consist of? And the thing that is striking to me is how many things happened in any given year. So here we have one list, a list that has to do with nuclear structure and decay schemes. And, and the subjects, more or less, along the timeline are written in, in green, and the black lines, the black ones, are the names associated with it. Well, we did the uh, we did decay schemes, you know, energy levels and things like that by the bushel. I, uh, uh, you know, sort of every every three months there was a list of five or six things just to to fill the literature. I think that's stuff that today would properly be distributed only uh, through uh, uh, on computer disks. But uh, we developed an awful lot of techniques, ways of doing things. And some of them were fun. One was this business of studying uh, nuclear uh, angular momenta, essentially, nuclear symmetry properties in, of states by angular correlation. The thing that happens when you get back and read those old papers, you say, my god, why did I even bother publishing this? This is, everybody knows that. And what one forgets is that until I published it, not everybody knew it. So, uh, uh, and I don't mean that I invented these things or that I, I created them out of, uh, all out of my brain. They, they were, of course, around and other people were doing similar things. But it was awfully exciting. Because look at the time scale. In this period of two years, part of which I was away in Stockholm, we opened up uh, correlations, gamma ray correlations, beta gamma correlations, and only a, a year or so later, we discovered that we could also measure the polarization of the gamma rays in, that, in these processes. So all the things that today you do as a matter of course were really quite new. Obviously, people had done it with optical, optical radiations, but nobody had ever done this with, with nuclear radiations. It was really exciting. And the other thing that, that is fun in looking back is the degree to which things that happened later were really already there seminally. The very first experiments we did on correlations between nuclear radiations, I had a chemist as a graduate student because I said the problems may well be chemical. You see, people had tried to do these experiments, but they, they didn't succeed. They didn't see any correlations. You must remember that the only radiation detectors one had at that time were uh, Geiger counters. And Geiger counters are not very efficient detectors of gamma rays. The circuits are slow. You can't use very strong sources. And people hadn't seen the effect. So I said to myself, why could that be? The correlations must be there. I mean, that's just the geometry of radiations. And uh, it's clear that they must be there. And I said, maybe maybe it has to do with the atomic fields perturbing 
the nuclei. And then I had the idea that wrong, that if we could get the stuff into a gas, then you wouldn't have so many neighboring nuclei, and then maybe you could see the correlation. So I got a chemist who said, yes, he could make a gaseous uh, compound of cobalt so that we could study the radiations. Cobalt for various, we cobalt 60 was a desirable nucleus to study. Now, as we now know, that was moving the wrong direction because, in fact, you're more likely to have a overall symmetric uh, situation and therefore no perturbing field in a solid, although maybe not for cobalt, but in general, than you have in a gas where the neighboring atom uh, you know, clearly defines the direction in the molecule. But uh, the idea was there, and as I will uh, show you in a few minutes, the fact that we did this turned out to be extremely useful uh, at a later point. And that is one of my points that if you get into physics of a particular area, everything's connected to everything else. Well, how's that song go? The, the uh, shin bone is connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bone. It, uh, if you, you, you learn physics, and it'll come in handy before long. And the other thing that I thought was maybe uh, if the atoms disturb it, maybe if one puts on an external magnetic field, one can uh, uh, one can overcome this. Now, those of you who are in the field know that that is true. The, the important point about it is I didn't understand it at all. I mean, I couldn't have sat down and calculated, except perhaps just up to grossly order of magnitudes, what would happen when you did these things. Did the experiment anyway. And that, I think, is a real difference. Because if I had had to build uh, L3 to see whether it's true or not, I clearly wouldn't have, right? I do, uh, and I think that is, is one of the big differences. It, uh, one could do, you know, in a certain sense, I am in experiments uh, the way Vicky says he is in theory, uh, lazy. That is the... Uh, uh, I, I like uh, an intuitive hand-waving argument, and uh, uh, if I do make an honest calculation, I won't let anybody know it, the, uh, because it, uh, I, f I find uh, it's demeaning. So uh, uh, I, uh, I have started many experiments on uh, what I persuaded myself was total ignorance. Because you see, after a few years, after we had, had seen these initial things, indeed uh, other people worked these phenomena out in detail, and the study of, uh, of uh, what happens to, uh, to uh, uh, nuclear orientation and therefore the correlations of the radiations that are emitted in uh, the presence of the atomic perturbation became a cottage industry and uh, in which we also participated. And there were some very, very entertaining experiments that were done by studying the crystal symmetry, by seeing what happens to the correlations. And uh, these experiments, of course, later were developed by people who are not ashamed of doing something carefully and uh, uh, combined with the Nussbauer experiments and Lee Gordon's, who sort of took over from me at the bottom of this page uh, uh, did some uh, uh, very outstanding work uh, in uh, this general uh, area. Now, at, uh, there were a number of other amusing things, which I think I, I, I like to uh, talk about because they tell you uh, how much fun one could have with, uh, with some of this physics. One of the things I was trying to, uh, uh, to study was the uh, Transition probabilities, when you have cascade, cascade gamma rays, that is a nucleus decays in a series of levels, uh, what is the probability of the crossover gamma ray? Because uh, uh, Vicky and, and others had, uh, had uh, developed uh, what was an, uh, at least an incipient theory of, uh, of uh, the transition probabilities. And uh, I say incipient in the sense that one didn't have a detailed nuclear model to make very specific calculations. But one 
could uh, in make uh, general estimates. Some had already been in the, uh, in the uh, Beatty Bible, but uh, uh, it was uh, greatly refined in, in Blatt and Weisskopf. And so uh, there were definite predictions. And the idea was maybe we could learn something about nuclear structure by seeing uh, what the relative transition probabilities were. So what that involved was perhaps to look for transitions that were very rare. And a typical example might be, I don't know, a, a cobalt-60, where you have two gamma rays of uh, 1.1, 1.3 MeV in cascade. What is the probability of the crossover gamma ray? Now, you would think that's easy because you just look with some kind of a detector. I, it isn't that easy. Uh, I don't want to go into, into technical details. But there is a way of making a detector that will only detect the high energy gamma ray. And that is if you let it make a nuclear disintegration, which has a threshold that is higher than the energy you have on the single gamma rays. So what we said is, all right, you take cobalt, you put it, say, with heavy water. Then you should get a photo disintegration of the deuteron. You'll get some neutrons. But how do we detect the neutrons? There'll be very few. And what we did was something that is uh, known as the Szilard Chalmers process. We got a vat about this big, and we filled it with a solution of uh, potassium permanganate, you know, uh, the thing you can gargle with. and. Uh, now, we put the source in the center of that. A neut the neutron will be captured by the manganese. When the manganese captures the neutron, its oxidation state is reduced, and it is precipitated as manganese dioxide. Then we took this big vat and filtered it, and all the activity was on a little filter paper. And that way, you could detect, oh, one part in 10 to the seventh of gamma rays. I thought that was a fun experiment, because you didn't have to, uh, to uh, write a proposal. Uh, you, uh, you did some, something new. So a lot of that happened. Uh, a lot of that kind of thing went on. Now, in my confused way of not looking too hard, I had a two, I had an idea that and I, I voiced that, and I'll tell you how I got slapped down properly. I said, look, electromagnetic and, uh, uh, interaction and beta decay have something in common. I don't know what it is. In retrospect, I know what it was I was talking about. At the time, I didn't. When I said, is, look, the selection rules are the same. You get the same kind of, of, uh, of what it looks like a multipole expansion. And especially if you look at things like uh, internal conversion. You know, where, where the energy is not emitted as a gamma ray, but as an electron from the shell. It really looks very much the same as far as uh, what Vicky calls angular physics is concerned. The only thing is the charge changes. In one case, an electron becomes a neutrino. In the other case, it stays an electron. Don't these things have something in common? Well, I, uh, I said, I, I don't know why this should, uh, what it should be. I, uh, I asked uh, Ullenbeck. Michigan, who was expert on beta decay, and he said to me, you don't understand Fermi theory. This is nonsense. The electron neutrino is the, is the field. There isn't a field in between, like the electromagnetic field that induces the transition. Well, the first part of the statement was correct. I did not understand Fermi theory. The second part of the station, uh, statement, of course, was wrong, because there is a W uh, Z in between. So, uh, that's so much for listening to the theorists. Uh, the, uh, uh, Maurice Goldhaber said something that was, I think, more constructive. He listened and said, well, I think that needs to be fleshed out a little. <laughs> but the idea, uh, the idea persisted, and it, it sort of haunted me until the, the real answer came out. And then I had some real crazy ideas. For example, I said, look, in high energy beta decays, there is, am among other processes, an electromagnetic process that creates electron pairs. Now, that means you've got one more electron in there. I mean, the transition uh, 
in making the pair of a negative positive energy state. And if there really is something which electromagnetic and beta decay transitions have in common, maybe you get interference terms. It's wrong. Totally, totally silly idea now that we understand what happens. But I said, let's try it. And I didn't have to write a proposal, and it didn't cost me money, just cost a graduate student's life. So, uh, I don't mean he died, I mean he just wasted his time. Uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was Jack Greenberg, who uh, searched for positrons, an anomalous number of positrons. And uh, uh, let's see, uh, uh, Dave Peasley, I think, did the calculation for No, it was Kirsten Huang who did the, one of the two, did the calculation for us. But in the process of looking for this, this thing, we found a lot of other interesting positrons coming from other, other processes. So another case where misunderstanding the, uh, the uh, theory in the proper way was very productive. Well, I don't think there is much sense in, uh, in telling you all the detailed things that happened. Uh, and it was then in 1956, it must have been 56, that an, one more new thing happened in, in this game. And that was, of course, when, when the parity violation was, uh, was discovered. And I remember being called up uh, at an unusual hour by Shen Chen Wu, who told me what was happening, which I had heard already from Rabi. And she said, look, uh, uh, I, why don't you, why don't you come down and have a look? We can't, uh, we, we believe the experiment, right? Uh, but we'd like you to, uh, to, uh, to look at it. And I came down and looked at the apparatus, and, and one of the big problems was in which direction was the magnetic field. You see, was the helicity positive or negative? And uh, I said, how did you check the field? Uh, she says, well, with a compass needle. I said, you be careful, because you can, can, uh, can polarize a compass needle. No, no, we did it all right. And, and uh, then, so then she said, we, uh, uh, no, I, I said, are you sure? The compass, yes, the compass needle was all right. And I said, okay, now tell me one more thing. Did you think in Chinese or did you think in English? Because in Chinese you say the compass points south. It's just as good, I mean, it's just the other end. And she turned red for a moment. No, it's all right. So you see how careful you have to be in, uh, in physics. But uh, one of the problems that was left over was the question whether, whether the polarization in a pure Fermi transition, uh, the helicity will be the same. In retro, and then now that we have a theory, this is all obvious. But we had a problem left, uh, the problem was left over, and we're going to look at the, at the helicity of positrons in pure Fermi transitions. And that was an interesting thing uh, uh, in, a, in a social sense. I, uh, 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 Maurice Goldhaber and uh, Lee Gordsons had done this extremely pretty experiment on the uh, helicity of the neutrino in orbital electron capture. It's a real gem. It's one of those, uh, those experiments. You say, gee, isn't it cute? You know, this is one of the troubles why I hate retrospectives. I, I, I just hate them. And the reason is anybody who's ever done an experiment, probably theorists have the same thing. You look back at an experiment a couple of years later, and you know exactly what you should have done and when you do that on a large scale, it, it can, get, can get quite painful. But anyway, the, uh, 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 the, uh, they, they had the same idea we had about uh, how, how one does this, uh, the, this detection of the helicity by, by determining the circular polarization of the annihilation radiation. And uh, we're both going to do it in chlorine 34. And Bernie Gittleman was a graduate student working on that. And uh, so I said, look, uh, uh, let's not do something silly, because if we are running a competing experiment, that'll, that'll make us publish prematurely, and maybe we'll publish some nonsense. Let's keep each other informed how we're doing. And uh, uh, then, you know, if one of us thinks he has enough data to publish, he'll tell the other one who can either, we have to trust each other, we are honest people. I, if he thinks he has good, good enough data, he will have a chance to publish it. If not, one publishes first. And we went on. Now, I hope Lee will, uh, will check whether my recollection is correct. Or because, you know, all autobiographies are lies. Because you only remember what you like, and if there isn't anything to remember you like, you invent it. So let me tell you the, uh, uh, what I think 
happened. We both worked on it, and it was pretty miserable. This, uh, they are, it's a very difficult experiment, the way we were doing it. And I, uh, I was quite dissatisfied. On the other hand, probably by the way the statistics worked out, the Brookhaven people were a little more comfortable. And it went on, and we both were, were somewhat uh, uh, unhappy. But finally, uh, I said, look, this isn't going to converge. I said to Bernie, let's do a different experiment. Uh, let's do it differently. Let's lose a, use a spectrometer. And I think uh, at the time, the, uh, there was a, it, it was not an open and shut decision. That is, I think uh, the guys in, uh, you guys thought you, you had an answer. But then we compared our data. We said, that's no good. And we, I said, look, Lee, the thing to do is come up here, come to MIT, and we'll do the experiment together and do it right. And we did it, and we did it right, and it was an extremely successful experiment because Lee stayed. And that was, uh, that's why this was an important experiment. There was a whole series of other things, but now you say, well, okay, that's nice. You have a, a, a spectral lab for nuclear spectroscopy. The problem is that something else went on at the same time. Now, when I put this on here, you will, of course, find that you can't, uh, can't read this anymore because there's too much. Maybe you can, some of it can be read. The, uh, this was, we started working with positrons. As you can understand, I, I said, look, there's positron annihilation, and since I had the crazy idea that electromagnetic interactions might also involve some other interaction, I said, maybe if we look at positron annihilation, we will discover some other interactions between electrons. In retrospect, that's, that's absolutely childish because we know the mass of the W of the W of the Z is mu are much too high to see in phenomena of that low an energy. But it was fun. So I said, let us, uh, I see no reason why these have to be. You see, the reason I put these on top of each other was that they happened on top of each other. And uh, that was the great fun that was going on. All these things went on in parallel. So the first thing I said, well, let's see what happens when we, the only, we, we don't really know how strong the, annihil the annihilation cross-section had never been measured, at least not in any, any meaningful way. So let's see what happens if one measures the annihilation of positrons in flight, a totally trivial thing, you would say, today. Uh, so we started with it. I had a student, Shearer. Who, uh, who did it first. And this thing continued and was finally done properly a couple of years later by Henry Kendall. It's interesting, you know, you just noticed something. We put these people together here, the, these black ones, all the people that, that worked with me. So we've, let's see, we got Siegbahn, Kendall, and Richter, three Nobel Prize winners. Not bad, is it? The, uh, uh, so uh, we... Uh, 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 so that was straightened out uh, uh, then. But then I said to Shira, look, this, this wasn't a very good experiment. There is a way of measuring the cross-section at low energies by doing it in a gas. Because you calculate the, uh, the cross-section and the density, how much material is it, should just be in the right range for these very nice things we have developed, which were uh, relatively good time resolution counters that would allow us to measure lifetimes in the order of 100 nanoseconds, which was very fast at the time. That should be just about the range and will tell us something about the interaction, which was, of course, again nonsense, because you don't have free electrons. You've got the, the annihilation occurs in a very complicated field. The available electron density is almost impossible to calculate. So again, it was rather nonsense, but the experiment was interesting. And somewhere around here, reading in the, in the uh, progress reports, it says, well, we did the first experiments, but something's wrong. Because whatever the interaction is, after all, if you put more gas in, the annihilation must go faster because there are more electrons, and it must go proportionately faster. And that, of course, then led, uh, the, the explanation was, of course, then positronium. And that then was a lot of fun, but I will not tell the positronium story again. I'm just, uh, you know, you give this talk, uh, 
certain positron a certain number of times, and then you, you say everybody must be so bored because they've heard it so many times, so I'm not going to do it even if particular people have not seen it. What I do want to show is how fast this stuff went. It branched into two areas. In one direction was the, the chemistry of positronium, and there we had a lot of, uh, of fun. As I look back at the reports, that stuff was never really properly published because I, I couldn't get myself to believe that it was really interesting. Or maybe the reasons were different. Maybe there were personal reasons. I don't really know. It was never uh, properly published, but the whole industry has grown up around it. I, I see occasionally in the literature people do experiments that to which we really had the answers at that time. Uh, but you know, they, I, I have at times I have that contempt for chemistry of a, of a typical physicist. At other times, I think uh, uh, the opposite. I'm, I'm a chemist at heart. But that's where this sort of uh, didn't go quite as far as it should. What we did instead was to, uh, we, we studied, of course, the fine structure, which was very exciting stuff, and made a, a big splash. And as I say, I don't want to go over that again, although in some ways it might be appropriate. Only one thing that is not known is that we also tried to look for the first excited state, of po optically excited state, of positronium, and that was Henry Kendall's thesis. Uh, it sort of failed, probably. You can ask him. Maybe, maybe he saw it, maybe he didn't. It was an extremely ingenious thing. It was his idea. I was away that year, as I you put this thing over it, I think it should show out that I was in Paris at the time. and. Uh, I have referred to that several times, uh, most uh, recently when an Italian colleague uh, said that I should really get a particular student to write a thesis on something we are doing, and I said, look, that's not good enough. And he said, oh, look, he will be very happy to get such a straightforward thesis. And I said, no, I had two students who, at least two students, who turned down a thesis, an offer that they could, uh, could write a thesis on something they'd already done because they thought the, uh, the stuff wasn't good enough for their doctor's thesis. Uh, one was Henry Kendall, and the other was Ray Steining, whose name you saw before, both of whom decided to do something uh, more interesting. And I think that when you get that uh, student who does that, you know you've got a winner. All right, uh, I'm now, s I'm stopping at this point. Many things happened after that. But what happened, uh, as far as uh, my life was concerned, was that, uh, among other things, that at that point, I became uh, chairman of a directing committee of the lab. The story was the following. Uh, uh, Gerald Zacharias, who had created the lab, decided he had enough. And Pete Demos, who had been uh, designated in pectore, as, as, the, as you know the expression, uh, to, uh, some time before was considered still a little bit too young. And uh, people asked me whether I would become director of the lab for a few years. And I said, no, I won't do that. But if we will create a directing committee, and I will serve as chairman of that committee, and I promise never to call a meeting of the committee. And then they said, well, why do you want to be only chairman? I said, it's very simple. When I've had enough, if I am chairman, I just say, well, I guess the chairmanship should rota uh, rotate. And that's the end of it. You just rotate and somebody else does it. If you're chairman, you have to say, I'm going to resign as chairman. And you need a search committee. And they keep you there for another year. So uh, that was the reason. And at that point, so I changed direction. And I decided I also should get out of the field and went on to do uh, some high energy physics. Now I only have to spend two minutes to tell you uh, why, uh, I mean, ob it's obvious to you now why I couldn't, couldn't give this paper, uh, this talk to you, because it doesn't prove any of the things that I, I wanted to prove. And the reason it doesn't is because the things that I was saying were false. I said we didn't have to write proposals, but we had to write a quarterly progress report. I said we didn't have to, to struggle for money from Washington. 
I still don't struggle for money in Washington. I mean, I've, I've never, uh, just like Vicky, I've never had the experience of not getting money for something I really th thought needs doing. I think, uh, I don't think, I don't think uh, that's the difference. I know now, last night, I suddenly realized what the difference really is, why it was so much more exhilarating, so much more fun. Uh, so one thing, I learned it from my mother when I was a very young man. She tried to tell me why life was so much better under the emperor than it was under the republic. And she said, you know, uh, uh, people were courteous, there wasn't that much crime, there was order, uh, people were dressed better, and most important, one was so young. <laughs> Thank you.